bill insurance, um, which would be like the subject, the main subject of our of our of our talk would be um, there's a difference between um, the traditional method of purchasing a property, which would be where somebody would go out and obtain the real property report for the property. Um, so you'll see in a lot of the uh, the area purchase contracts, there's going to typically be that one line in there or a clause in there, which sets out that um, a real property will be provided on or before X period of time, right? What the real property report is, is basically it's like a survey of the property itself. Um, now, depending on when the last real property report was completed or updated, those might be quite dated. So just to backtrack for the people that don't know the term, survey meaning a professional surveyor comes and measures the property lines and you know the dimensions of the sheds and, and the building itself, that kind of thing? Right, okay. yeah. So basically is like an overview not a picture, like, but it's more of like a drawing, like a, like almost like an architect type strat to like sketch, like a blueprint, like a blueprint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it shows then what the exact um, dimensions are of the property lines, where they're situated, and so on and so forth. So it shows exactly this is your parcel of land. Mm -hmm. Then within that real property report, it's going to show the house, and it's going to then also likely indicate if there's any outbuildings and stuff like that, like sheds, garages, and stuff like that. Um, so when the real property report is ordered. Um, that is typically what they will order is that document. Um, they'll get, they'll obtain a copy of that. Um, and the interesting thing on the real property report that I have always struggled with in terms of what does it mean to get a real property report with compliance? Well, a real property report is basically you order a copy of that report, um, which would be like a historical document, depending on when the last one was that was updated. Um, that's going to going to show the layout of the property, the fence lines, the, you know, the, the sheds, everything else on it. Um, you would think that then in order for it to get a compliance, that it would then have to go to the municipality and the municipality would then physically take that real proper report and would attend at the property and then make sure that everything is exactly where it was supposed to be. But that's not actually the reality. So what ends up happening is the person who orders the real proper report will actually swear an affidavit saying that this is in fact a true representation of the property. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem is, is that, well, that's based on that person's word saying, in fact, that this is accurate, right? Um, they then will send that affidavit in with, along with the real property report to the municipality. And then based on that affidavit and its truthfulness, which they're assuming is truthful, they will then stamp it with compliance. Mm -hmm. um, then the issue becomes, though, that, well, what if something was not in compliance? Um, and then suddenly the municipality does go and do an inspection at some point and says, well, there's this deck which was built onto the house and there wasn't the proper permit taken out for that. Um, or the shed is in fact on the neighbor's property line or the fence line or this, this fence line is actually not exactly where it's supposed to be. Well, what are your remedies as a, as a home purchaser? Well, your only remedies at that point would then be that you have to then proceed with an action against the previous owner um, saying essentially that they um, were dishonest or that the real proper report was not in fact in compliance. And they misrepresented that, which is obviously a costly process in order to do that. Um, so then there is an option, which is typically sort of the go to here in Grand Prairie. It's a little bit different, like in the larger municipalities like Edmonton, Calgary, where they almost on all those transactions will then say that it has to be a real property report and there has to be compliance. Um, out here in Grand Prairie, it seems to be the standard practice that there's always the title insurance, which is ordered in lieu of the real property report. So what that means is, is there's actually um, title insurance companies that us as law firms, we can then deal with and then um, uh, enter into agreements with their clients or with the lender to get the title insurance policy in place. So there's a number of different ones. There's Stewart Title, Chicago Title Insurance, FCTU, and there's like Title Plus. Um, there's different options that are available and depending on which law firm you're dealing with, they may you know, more primarily deal with one company rather than the other. Um, so what the, there's two aspects then as to what the title insurance will typically cover. Um, so when somebody takes possession of a property, so say, for example, your closing date is March 26th. So our obligation as lawyers for you as the purchaser um, is to ensure that up until March 26th that you have clear title to the property. So you're purchasing a property and then there's nothing on there that's adverse um, to title. You know, there's going to be easements, there's going to be, you know, right of ways, there's those kind of things, encumbrances and stuff like that, that may be permitted. 
Um, so just part of uh, the title. So we have to review that and make sure that all of these things that are on title are regular, normal types of, you know, you know uh, encumbrances or, or easements that are on there. Um, what happens though, is that if there's something like a mortgage or a second mortgage, or there's something that's been initiated by creditors, like a lien or something like that, or even a certificate of Liz Pendens, which is like a certificate of pending litigation, we have to then ensure that when you're purchasing the property that you're going to get clear title to the property. Um, so that, that when it comes back from land titles office is that it shows that you're now the, the registered owner of the property and your name's on title and there's none of those things that are adverse that are on title when you purchase it. The problem is, is that up until March 26, is that we have the ability to search title but after that, we're then subject to basically sending those documents in the title transfer and everything else into land titles office. And then that may take up to a month and a half to two months for them to then complete the registration process. So legally, during that period of time, you're not actually legally the owner of the property. You're only a tenant in the property up until the point of when registration is completed with land titles. So with the title insurance part that then covers off is it's called gap insurance. So the gap would be from March 26th up until the point of when registration is completed that the title insurance company will then go and deal with anything adverse that comes onto title during that period of time. So during the month and a half or the two months, you know, the previous owner, they might have been subject to creditors or, you know, CRA or different types of, you know, things that could pop up that would want to put a lien onto the property. Well, those creditors would do a title search and they would see, well, this person that's selling you the property is still the legal owner of the property because nothing has been registered since showing that there's now a purchaser. So they go ahead, they register whatever it is that they want on title in terms of then, you know, an actual uh, a lien or some type of caveat onto title. Um, but they don't know that somebody's purchasing the property. So then title insurance will then cover you off during that two month period and then deal with getting that removed off to give you as the purchaser clear title. So that's the first part of the title insurance. The second part of the title insurance is then, um, well, what happens if in the event that you purchase the property and then there are things that come up in, related, in relation to um, where there wasn't permits taken out, there's things that are you know, with zoning issues or non-compliance issues, if those come up, the title insurance company could provide you some relief in relation to that. Whereas if you're purchasing the property based strictly off of the real property report, it's more or less it's you as the purchaser buying it as is where it is and then having to bring that action against the previous seller. Whereas the title insurance, they could cover you off for your legal costs and some fees and different costs in order to then deal with those issues as they come up. It's not saying that they will all of the time, um, but it is something that they, they could cover you in the event of those irregularities coming up. And then you find out that it's not in compliance and you have to now go and tear off this deck or it needs to be expanded or it needs to be moved or, or those type of things. They, they could potentially provide you with some relief for that in relation to legal fees, et cetera. So those are the two parts. And basically with the cost of title insurance is that it's normally, it's around like 200 to $250. And it's um, typically with the way that the purchase contracts are done is that the, the seller of the property will normally cover off those costs in relation to the purchaser of the property. So they're, they will, they're obligated or they agree that they'll pay for that $200 fee. And then that $200 fee is then in the name of the purchaser's name as the policy. And then we actually give them a copy of the policy and they have that as part of their closing package. So if a buyer sees a clause of the contract that states a title insurance will be provided by the seller in lieu of the real property report, it means the uh, only the title insurance will be provided, but that is the one that actually has more leverage when it comes to any issues with the property, right. whether it's in the transition period where, where the title's office is working on the uh, changeover right. or after the fact, if like the city discovers that there's a defect or a permit wasn't right. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because that's the thing is that, you know, the, the misunderstanding is the fact that, well, once you get a real property report and it's in compliance, well, that means that it's everything is 100% good to go in terms of that. Well, it's not necessarily true because they could still come do an inspection, find out well something was in fact adverse and this was there was not a permit taken out for this particular reno or build or, or those kind of things. Um, so then that's where the title insurance would then kick in and then provide potentially some relief for that. 
Um, yeah, and I think a good example would be, let's say, I mean, we're all human, we make mistakes, right? You get a surveyor onto your property and then, you know, I think in Grand Prairie you have to have four feet between your fence and your uh, structures. Right. Right, and all of a sudden it's three and a half feet and right. it gets missed on the report and you sign off saying that, yeah, this is a true and uh, accurate statement. And then an inspector comes, a city inspector comes and all of a sudden, oh no, your shed is six inches too close to your fence line. You have to move it or take it down. Right. And all of a sudden it's a permanent structure and it's a garage and all of a sudden you have a major problem in your hands. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and there's that, that's the type of issue that title insurance may cover. And again, I always use the word may cover because it's not saying that definitively that they will cover for all of these issues. There's a potential that at least you can make a claim through them and you might have some relief through that avenue. Right. And, and it's one of those things that, you know, the title insurance companies, like they do deal with a lot of transactions and, and typically as long as it's not something that's structural, because that would be another issue of insurance. Like that's where basically you would have to have your own home insurance policy, which is separate from this. Right. This is only dealing with these specific areas and issues of like basically closing the real estate deal, the transaction, the conveyancing, but then also in terms of compliance and those type of issues. Right. Um, there is also like there's other sort of irregulars or different sort of things that they may cover as well, like in terms of like septic tanks and stuff like that, that things that you can't you know readily look at and take it, you know, and see and inspect. There is some different, you know, clauses and things like that, that they may provide some relief for that, too. So it's, it's definitely something that, you know, it's 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 worth looking into. It's worth assessing. Um, but at the same time, I mean, it doesn't stop somebody from also getting a copy of the real real property report as well. Right. It's just that there is added costs with that. So as part of like, if you're as the purchaser, you want a copy of the real property report, you can by all means order it, or you, but there's going to be some out-of-pocket fees that you're going to have to pay to get that. Mm -hmm. And it may be worthwhile just to get an idea of, okay, well, this is where everything's laid out. This is where all the property lines are. And then you kind of have an idea of, well, where do I want to build or what can I build or what's my limitations and those kind of things, right? And it's also helpful as well is that if you look and you're buying a property and then you want to put on... Um, you know, you want to build a garage. Well, you probably want to get a copy of the real property report to then make sure that the contractor has that and then can get, you know, go to the city, get the proper permits taken out in order to build it without then overstepping compliance or, or not doing with the proper permit, right? So if you, as the homeowner, um, want to build a garage and let's say you go out there, you take measurements of, you know, your fence lines and then can the contractor use that as they still need an official report? Right? They still need to get an actual like permit from the city. Yeah. So anything that you're building onto, like if it's considered like an outbuilding or if it's considered an addition onto the property, there has to be the proper permits that are taken out. So that has to be done through the city. Um. So so the issue is, I mean, that's kind of like well, people do do a lot of home renovations, right? And they will do a lot of stuff on their own. And then inevitably they may say, well, I'm just going to build it and then simply I'll just sell the house with title insurance on it. Well, it's not saying that they can't do that, but they shouldn't be doing that. They should actually be getting the proper permits, right? Because mm -hmm. anytime, you know, any contractor and anybody that you hire has to have permits in order to then do the proper work, right? right. But again, if you inspect the property um, and then you find out that there is an issue, in fact, when you look at the real property report and you order it, well, that's an irregularity that you probably want to bring up through your realtor in order to then probably negotiate out and figure out, well, is this going to become an issue later on? Because you don't want to have to just simply rely on the title insurance. There may be some other outs where then you can probably get it built properly or get it as part of the purchase contract, you know, done so that it is in compliance and that the city approves it. Because otherwise you're just kind of, you know, taking that person's issue, putting it off later on, dumping it on yourself mm -hmm. when you're purchasing the property. And then hoping that title insurance is going to cover this off. Well, they're likely there's going to be some ins and outs on that that they, you know, you probably want to, you could have most likely avoided mm -hmm. by just simply doing your due diligence. So I'm sure you've had clients reach out to you for legal advice uh, regarding, uh, uh, you know, inspection issues about the property layout uh, in regards to title insurance. Is there anything in Grand Prairie that comes up over and over again? Uh, for the title insurance uh, stuff like, you know, property lines, easements, encumbrances, like. I, I think that the, the main ones is typically, yeah, is with the decks, like, you know, people building decks on by themselves, right? Or sheds uh, or garages and stuff like that. But then most importantly, I mean, is the ones with like, you know, neighborhood disputes as well, right? So you have somebody that wants to build a fence or they want to build a fence that wasn't, you know, pre-existing fence. 
um, there would or could be issues in relation to that, right? In mm -hmm. terms of the fact, like it may be on your, it may be on your property line, it may be, you know, where it's crossing over, like, and then inevitably, then if you allow the fence to be built on your property line, then you're then going and potentially creating issues for yourself to then go and renovate and then build, you know, a garage and stuff like that. Or when you sell it, you're basically then passing that problem on to the next person, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other issue is that in terms of like a limitation act type thing, you allow it to happen. You only have two years to remedy it. You know, it becomes an issue where then essentially um, you could be out of time in terms of that. Right. So you definitely my due diligence advice typically, I mean, is, yeah, you probably want to at least see the real property report. But at the same time, I understand as part, you know, the title insurance is part of the whole transaction. Um, it's good to have both, really. Because if you get a copy of the real property report and you have the home inspector take a look at that and actually you know, review it, um, you're doing your double due diligence there. And then if there is any other unforeseen issues that come up, title insurance could potentially provide you with relief later on down the road. So if homeowners want to find out um, how high their fence can be or how big their garage can be, where do they find this information? Well, they, they typically would be able to go either through the home inspector, like they'd be able to provide you with the building codes and stuff like that, um, or a contractor, or alternatively, you could then also, you know, make the uh, inquiries with the city as well. Okay, but for example, I uh, did an open house in Carriage Lane and only chain link fences are allowed in Carriage Lane. Right. So where do they find out about stuff like so this? That, so that would be more in the actual bylaws, right? Because every, you know, you'd have to, again, ask your realtor, the realtor would then have to make their, you know, the inquiries to find out, well, you know, is there actually, you know, some types of restrictions or restrictive covenants that are registered in relation to these properties when they built them, right? And that could also come up on title as well through the lawyer's office when we do a search that there might be something that shows up on there as like some type of restrictive covenant. Mm -hmm. So that's all part of the title search. Because that's not uncommon is that there is a whole bunch of neighborhoods out there where it's like, well, you can't paint your house paint, right? Or you're mm -hmm. not allowed to, you know, do this certain color on the fence or you need to have chain link fences or there's certain restrictions on that. So those are things that people definitely, when they're purchasing a property, they want to make sure, you know, talk to the realtors, talk to the lawyers, and then talk to the home inspectors and then find out if there's anything like that that is in fact registered on title because that's where it would have to be is like in their bylaws or some type of restrictive covenant that basically sets that out. Mm -hmm. It's almost like um, like with like a condominium, for example, like a condominium is going to have certain restrictions where, you know, you can't, you know, put things in the windows, you have to have certain colors of paint, you can't do any additions or, you know, different things and, you know, that you want to, to spruce up the outside of your place. Well, those are all going to be inside of their bylaws that you're not allowed to do A, B, C, D, E, right? And then essentially by you taking on that property, you're then taking on that restriction as a purchaser that you're contracting into that so it's something that yeah they have to make sure they, they do the proper inquiries they find out like well is there anything that's you know i'm not allowed to do or i'm not allowed to do and and yeah different neighbors in town will definitely will definitely have those type of things in there so okay yeah um if as a buyer you're unable to negotiate that the sellers provide the title insurance then you as a buyer can still have the option to purchase it you yourself, can, yeah, right? You can still purchase it, basically. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that typically is that if, um, uh, that I think the standard area real estate contract will say that real property report shall be provided. And it's normally then the seller's obligation if that's not crossed off and say that title insurance will be provided in lieu of this, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's normally at the seller's expense, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but that is something that, yeah, if it's, you know, again, the real the realtors would be able to basically negotiate that out in terms of, well, who is going to cover this cost and, and who's going to be responsible for it. I mean, the grand scheme of things, it seems like it's a bit of a drop in the bucket because, you know, normally it's about a $200 fee, right? And mm -hmm. that's the thing is that is somebody going to dig in their heels and, you know, refuse to cover off a $200 fee when they have a potential buyer that's going to purchase their property? No, but yeah, just, they, just they for, may, right? Just but, for yeah. uh, the pe people yeah. to know that it, it is an option for you, even if the right. seller doesn't provide it because yeah. for whatever reason, right? I mean, stranger yeah. things have happened. Well, and also lenders may also have it as a condition that they want to have title insurance on there. Mm -hmm. So that then, like, of course, that that's then covering the lender as well. Um, and the thing is, is that, you know, people have to understand is like when you're buying a property and you're getting a mortgage on it, well, you're not actually the registered owner of the property until you paid off that mortgage. Well, the bank is actually the registered owner of the property. Right. So they want, they can impose that there's going to be title insurance then purchased. 
right? And then they may cover the cost, they may add it into your fees. Likely it's gonna come out of your own pocket as part of your closing costs. Yeah, because yeah, when you actually read the title certificate that you receive in the mail after you purchase a home, it states right on there that you know the bank of you know this or that and the other is the actual right. owner. And then I remember when I paid my house off fully, then I got another yeah. um, title certificate from the government and then it was only my name on there. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because the one the one interesting aspect that it does tie into is actually the whole tenancy as well, because of the fact that um, you know we uh, when we're representing the sellers on a transaction, is we'll actually impose that the purchaser's lawyer sign certain documents with the purchaser that are held on their file and their trust conditions. So there's going to be a covenant to restore title, and there's also going to be a transfer back as well. Um, and basically these documents then protect the seller because what happens is, is that the purchaser is not, even though they've, um, they've sent the funds, like they've, you know, um, they've met all their conditions in terms of their contract, they've taken possession of the property. They're not actually the registered owner of that property until the registration goes through with land titles. So there's a two month gap there where we have to then as lawyers get them to sign these documents saying that if for some reason that the title registration couldn't be completed, that then it allows then, you know, the, the seller can then get some relief and then have possession of their property taken back. Mm -hmm. So those are things that, you know, it, it kind of ties into that with the title insurance as well because of that whole gap period, right? So it's just an added insur assurance that if something does come up, that then basically it covers them off. And realistically, like from a lawyer's perspective, just the $200 fee for the title insurance just for that gap insurance part of it is definitely worthwhile for the peace of mind of it. Because if something does come up that's adverse, that suddenly gets registered on title for against the old previous owner, there's a whole bunch of costly court applications that would have to be done in order to get that then taken off or removed. Right. And or renegotiation in terms of all the fees, funds and everything else. Like it's, it, it could be basically catastrophic. Whereas if you have that in there with that gap insurance for the title insurance provider, then it's definitely some peace of mind that, okay, there's some instant relief that's going to be provided for that issue if it does come up. Uh, again, specific to Grand Prairie, would you say that the vast majority of purchase contracts, the sellers are providing the title insurance? Yeah, uh, almost all. Yeah. It seems okay. like the majority of them are. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the only like the, there is um, if we do deal with like out of town council and stuff, I mean, again, you know, we're subject to kind of what their standard practices, which may be real property report. Um, but then they also may say the title insurance in addition to the real property report could be provided. Right. Um, so it's just uh, it's one of those things that um, it, it is very common in here in Grand Prairie, but it's also important for people to understand, well, what is it and what does it cover? And is it just a formality? Well, no, it's not. It's actually something that is. You know, it legitimately covers off a number of issues if they do come up. Mm -hmm.